title is Financial Regulation and Financial Crises, and that's the plural. Uh, so, so uh, first, uh, uh, let me say I'm not going to give you a, uh, uh, a full-blown analysis of the particular financial crisis that obviously motivates this, this uh, talk. That's a very complicated uh, issue, and uh, 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 I couldn't do it. It's so complicated, I couldn't do it uh, even if I wanted to. I have my views on it. They will come out a little bit in the talk. But this is really going to be about uh, uh, a general, thanks, about general uh, 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 issues. Uh, uh, it's going to be about the interplay between the regulation of safety of stabil and stability of uh, uh, financial institutions. Uh, and, and you'll see how, how uh, the actual stability and the regulation of, the sa of stability interact with each other. It goes in a, a lot of different directions. Uh, uh, the regulation is designed to mitigate financial crises, deal with some of the consequences, but to try, uh, uh, if possible, to prevent these from happening. But as we'll see, it creates its own incentives. And they're incentives that can actually lead to crises. So this is going to be a very long example of how regulation creates incentives that undermine or offset the intent of the uh, uh, regulation. Uh, and I'm going to, because I like to deal with the world as it is, I'm going to try to indicate how the regulation actually has worked more than, oh, there'll be plenty of how it should work, but uh, uh, more on how it actually has worked. And I'll say a little bit, you know, we all come to economists, <laughs> Russell pointed out, uh, and ask what's going to happen in the future, and the, the, the honest answer is I don't know, uh, which is the answer I gave last time, of my last talk. But I'll have to say, uh, I, you, know, I, you expect me to say a little bit about what might happen more likely than not in the future, and I'll say a little bit about that. So let me start with the uh, why should we question? Why should we regulate financial institutions? And you, you know, this, this is going to be actually, I'm, I'm glad that uh, Jonathan's uh, talk came before mine because this is very complementary to all of that. Uh, you're going to see repetition actually here. We didn't coordinate, otherwise I would have cut back this part. But the typical answer you get is you, you want to regulate to c correct some kind of market failure. Uh, uh, and, and to see what this means in this context, let's look at a typical bank today. I want this to be, you know, very much in the world here. So let's look at a typical bank today. It's one, you know, you, you probably know something about. Uh, uh, and, you know, I talked about how exceptional Israel was, how, how exaggerated its response to uh, forces was the other day. This is a counterexample. This is a very ordinary bank. What you're looking at here is, it, it, when you break down the numbers, is very typical of banks of this size. Uh, all over the world. It says main balance sheet data, and that means there are funds that the bank uses, and then there are fu those funds have to be supplied by somebody, and the two have to balance. So this isn't everything on the balance sheet. It's the main items that you see from a, a typical kind of contemporary uh, a bank. And you want to notice some things about this balance sheet. Okay, first of all, there are assets that total around 375 billion shekels. Uh, 
the majority of this is in loans and securities. So that's the red, uh, you see that's about 310 billion shekels are in loans and uh, 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 securities. As I said, this isn't everything on the balance sheet, but that's, you can see, a, a, a big chunk is uh, 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 securities issued by corporations, governments pay interest, loans to the public, they pay interest too. What's not shown here is there's loans to governments, there's uh, buildings, that isn't shown, but you could see 310 billion shekels. Yes? Uh, as a poli-sci major, what exactly is securities? They, they, they are, they're, they're not a loan to you. They're a bond issued by a business which says, uh, uh, in 10 years, I'll pay you uh, a thousand shekels. Meanwhile, I'll pay you interest for uh, letting me, letting me have the funds. Okay, it could be a government, could be a, 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 a business. Now, what's what's important about both of these loans and uh, 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 securities is that they can lose value. The loan might not pay off. That bond is going to mature in ten years. And it trades, and a lot of it trades in the market, and it's subject to uh, uh, market fluctuations. Sometimes some of those securities are equities, ec stocks. Stocks go up and down. Uh, uh, so that's important. That that the uh, that 300 plus billion is is not uh, free of risk. Okay, so that's that. It's a balance sheet. So where does the money come from? Well, you, you, you can see it's mainly from depositors. It's about 270 billion. But also from uh, other sources. Uh, there, there are bonds that this bank issues to you and me and institutions and so on and so forth. That's a debt of this bank. It's going to pay off sometime in, in the future. That's 35 billion. And then the bank's owners put in uh, 30 uh, billion. Okay, so that's the blue, uh, the dark, the, the main sources of funds. Uh, where are they coming from? Where, who, who does this bank owe money to in some sense? Well, it owes money to depositors who can typically withdraw on one day's notice or very short notice. The bondholders, they have to tie their money up for some time. And then there's the shareholders who uh, threw their money in at the beginning and then reinvested earnings and sold new stock to new stockholders and so on and so forth. So those are three important sources of these uh, funds. Okay. Uh, and I promise everything that's coming from now on is going to be very easy for, if you just take it slowly for a poli-sci or a philosophy major to follow. There's nothing, it's a complicated kind of set of questions and uh, uh, a nuanced set of interactions, but I hope you'll see that the basic principles that link financial crises and regulation are not that uh, 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 complicated. They're very straightforward. Uh, Okay, so those are the main sources of funds. Now, there's another thing uh, you should notice, which is that the amount of cash that's on hand that this bank has access to is around somewhere north of 40 billion shekels. You see that that's the, the very top, uh, 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 the very top, the thing in, in uh, in green, and you'll, you'll notice that it's much less than the deposits. Those deposits can be withdrawn on demand or on very short notice, so you want to have some cash around, but it's much less cash around than the deposits. And it says the maximum amount of cash. Now, what does that mean? Uh, uh, a part of that 43 billion is a deposit at the Bank of Israel, which it has to keep by law or regulation. I don't know the local banking law, but uh, 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 there's a requirement that you keep a certain reserve 
as a proportion of your deposits. And if there's a requirement that you keep a certain proportion of your deposits at the central uh, bank, then you don't really have access to that cash in the, in the short run. Uh, so uh, uh, that's a detail. What's important is the comparison of the 43 that you see at the top and the 270 that you see in deposits from the public. Uh, uh, those of you who think a bank is a place where you put money in and it sits there waiting for you to come and take it out, you can see you are sadly mistaken. It, this, is, uh, this is called fractional reserve banking. Yeah, there's always a fraction of your deposits in uh, cash reserves available. Okay, so this kind, this system, which as I say, this isn't the, just the Bank of Poalim, I'm just using that as a, an example of any bank anywhere in the, the developed world has two risks associated with, with it. Okay, and they're related as you'll see. One is liquidity risk. So that, the question is, what happens if it's someday for whatever reason, some of those depositors want to take out more than 43 billion in cash. Let's say that someday some, the depositors, one fourth of them in this example, that's a, uh, around 70 billion, want their money back. What, what happens? This bank doesn't have 70 billion in cash. Okay. Now, it's got to somehow raise another 25, 30 billion shekels. It could try to borrow it. It could try to sell assets. Or it'll have to say, you know, honestly, I can't meet this demand for conversion. This has happened in history. Not here, but it's happened uh, elsewhere. So th those are the alternatives. You either find it or you say, I can't, uh, I can't, meet, uh, I can't meet this uh, demand. The other risk is a solvency risk. So as I said, those loans and securities can go down in value. They can go up, but they can also go down. And suppose they go down for some reason. I will get to the reasons in a minute. Let's say there's a big crash in, in the stock market. At the, at the same time, loans and the, the loans start to default, have to be written down, and those, those assets are worth only $150 billion. Well, the bank becomes insolvent. It, it would have total assets now. It, I'll, you'll show on, see it on the next uh, uh, slide that are worth only 220 billion, but are, it owes depositors alone 270. And that's not to mention those bondholders who it's promising in five years or so to pay off uh, another 35 billion. It doesn't have assets to meet those obligations. So he, here's an example of what, what's going on. Uh, the, the broad stripe in the middle is dividing the, uh, the assets from where the assets come from. And it starts out by kind of saying, suppose those loans and securities decline in value from 300 to 150. All right, so that, assuming the cash stays at 70, you now have 220 instead of 370. You have the same liabilities to the depositors and everybody else. So the owners are below zero. But uh, that means that uh, the assets are insufficient to cover the obligations. Uh, all right, so, so what, what happens then? Uh, 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 what's going to happen? Well, to see what's going to happen, uh, let me first indicate it's already, I think,
clear that there's a link between these two kinds of risks. So let me make that a little bit explicit. It says two scenarios. You can have six scenarios, but they would all come to pretty much the same kind of story. So let's say the, the, what's going on there in the last picture is there's some adverse macroeconomic news. There's a recession. The Chinese economy falls apart and, and uh, imports from the rest of the world go, go, start to go down and, and uh, 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 this bank had a lot of loans to people who were in the uh, business of uh, finding uh, copper for the Chinese. They go broke, they start not to be able to pay their debts, the stock market crashes. Okay, so what happens then? That's the solvency risk. Okay, the depositor says, start to think, is there enough assets to cover my claims on this bank? Maybe not. Okay. They know this is fractional reserve banking. There's much less than one shekel in cash for each shekel in deposits. You know that. What do you do? You'd like to get your money back. When do you want to get your money back? Right now. Right now because you know there's going to be 270 billion in claims against assets which are worth less than 270 billion. That, that's called a bank run. People start lining up in the old, you know, the pictures you see from the old days, they're lining up in the street to try to get to be the first one to get their money back. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The bank has to start trying to meet these obligations, it starts selling the rest of its assets, uh, often at what are called fire sale prices. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that forces security prices down even further, and uh, the run is self-fulfilling. Uh, uh, so, so that's that's one scenario. So here's another one. This is the information I I issue that was raised uh, today. This we like to call this asymmetric information. One side knows more than the other side. But there's no way for the truth to be communicated from one side to the other. Here's an example. Suppose the economy actually is doing pretty well. This bank is OK. But the news that you got was not about the big macro economy. It was there's another bank, Bank Lumi or somebody like that. They just announced a huge loss. OK, now this actually happened seven years ago, six years ago. Uh, uh, banks started announcing unexpectedly huge losses. That bank may be subject to a run now for all the reasons on the previous uh, 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 slide. But what about this bank that I'm telling you is just fine? But how do you know? Can the depositor be sure that this bank didn't make the same kind of loans or buy the same kind of securities as the bank Hapoalim? Uh, uh, in, in fact, some of those loans are loans to other banks, maybe the one that just got into trouble. And the cash reserves are deposits at those banks. And there's a run on that bank. So you can't even be sure that the cash uh, on Hapoa Lim's books is, is uh, 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 going to be available. OK, so now suppose the bad bank actually, uh, you know, it, it runs out of cash. It suspends convertibility of its deposits. The, 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 the depositors at this bank are going to start to worry that the same thing is going to happen here. 
And remember, the, the first principle of bank runs is if there's going to be a run, you want to be first in line. So there's, a, there's a, uh, an effect, even though we start out but with, I'm telling you the facts in the back, bank apolim is fine. There's no way to communicate that credibly to the depositors in a case like this. If, you, if, if the TV sticks a microphone in front of the president of the bank Apollim and says, is your bank as bad as the other one? He's never going to say, he's never going to say, yes, of course, we're just like that other bank. No, he's going to say, no, 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 we're fine. And you discount that, rationally discount that, because you know he has to say it. Uh, uh, and you get in line. You say, well, I don't believe that. Okay, so the first thing, bef uh, yes, please. Maybe we'll get to this later, but in the case of a, of a perceived insolvency that's where, where a bank is actually fine, won't it, won't it sit, even if there is a run, won't it correct itself a week later when people see that the information was false? Won't the bank get back up on its feet <coughs> fairly quickly? How do you know? You know, if there's, if there's just a suspicion that the bank is not even as bad as the other one, but bad. Right? What's your incentive? To wait around until you're convinced that it's not true? You don't know it's not true. Remember, you don't know it's not true. The one thing you know is there's a lot less than one shekel there to cover your deposit. And there might be not enough assets in total to cover all deposits. Might be because you see this other bank in trouble, and you know the banks are linked. So what's your incentive? What, what would you do? Right, so let's say, that, let's, say, let's say there is a run in the bank, even though the perception is false. Yes. Two weeks later, three weeks later, when the, the market shares of the bank are going up again, are people just going to go back and redeposit their money? That's a separate question. That's an interesting separate uh, uh, question. The answer depends entirely on what happened in between. Okay, uh, processes like this can lead to the. You, you can see, but uh, 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 another thing that I didn't uh, that I didn't emphasize. It doesn't take much to make both of these banks completely unviable and require a complete ground-up reorganization uh, of both of them, which means the whole banking system in a country, uh, in a country like uh, this. Maybe if I can flip, uh, I'm not going to do it, but uh, uh, you remember how much the equity, the owner's interest in the, th the owner's source of that 375 billion total was? About 25 or 30? That's typical of banks. All the rest is borrowed from somebody, most of it from depositors, but from other people uh, too. Uh, uh, the typical bank not only has fractional reserves, but is highly leveraged. The, 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 typical, the typical mix between uh, uh, owner's equity and borrowed sources of money for an ordinary business would be 50-50, uh, that would be highly leveraged already, right? If, if you're talking about a risky business like a high-tech uh, business, it would be 100% would be coming from the owners. Okay, this one is 8%. All it takes is a small decline, a small shock, and this kind of contagion can take hold, and it can drive prices of securities down, and it can force businesses to, uh, to default because they can't get new credit in, in an environment like, uh, like this. Uh, uh, and the bank is, a, is gone. Very quick, can happen very quickly. So the answer is it depends a lot on what happens in the intervening period. If, if, if you get through the crisis and uh, uh, the, the market comes back and all of that kind of thing, yeah, the, you can go back to the bank and the bank can be viable. And there have been cases like that historically. Okay? 
the question that we're going, getting very slowly to, to is, uh, do those cases occur more often in a regulated system or, an, or a less regular or unregulated system? Uh, and that's what I want to get to uh, next. You know, what would happen in a case like this if you didn't have government intervention in the banking uh, system? Well, you'd get competition. Kind of the opposite of regulation would be competition. Uh, 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 and it would be a competition in the composition of the balance sheet. Each bank would be facing a trade-off between paying higher interest rates on its deposits or having a stronger balance sheet. Now, what does that mean? Yeah, so here's an example. This bank that we're talking about now has a capital ratio, we just mentioned this, around 8%. Stockholders equity is 8% of uh, uh, assets. Okay, what that means is that's the maximum limit of asset losses before you have a solvency issue, before you have a clear solvency issue. You'd have solvency problems before it got to zero, but uh, 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 the assets can lose 8% total in value uh, before you have an insolv uh, a clearly insolvent uh, institution. Uh, 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 so I'm going to skip this last one. Okay. So that, that's, that's what we have, uh, uh, that's what we have uh, here. And then the question is, uh, suppose there's uh, another bank there that has a capital ratio of 20%. Where are you going to put your money? Well, you'd, everything else being the same, you would rather have your money there because that bank can suffer a bigger decline in its uh, assets before it runs into an insolvency risk. Okay, Unless this bank pays me a higher interest rate to compensate. So you have this kind of trade-off between, uh, it's, it's a risk-reward trade-off. You can take the bigger risk and leave your money here. Uh, uh, or you can go elsewhere and uh, 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 have a less risk at a, lower, at a lower interest rate. And the bank has to think about if it has uh, a less, ca less capital to absorb losses, how much higher interest rate is it going to have to pay as a result of that. And now we get to market failure. Why would this kind of uh, competition fail in the sense that uh, it, 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 it would leave uh, 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 some room for improvement by, by government regulation. Well, you heard this morning that a typical a answer to such a question is there's a whole list of market failures. One of them is externalities, negative externalities, I like to say, because it's bad. There are also good externalities, but that's not going to concern us today. And, and what are the, what's this externality? Well, the, the adverse effects of a transaction between you and me, well, you heard it explained, it, it leaves other people potentially injured. So who's you and me here? It's, it's me and my bank. And who are the others? It's other, other people who deal with other banks. OK, so uh, what, are the, what, what is the relevant externality here? Uh, it says the twin risks lead to twin externalities. Uh, one is that uh, my and my bank's transactions can harm other banks. Okay, uh, so so uh, uh, when I go to Hapoalim, I buy their deal with their package of interest rates and capital, and uh, it makes sense. It it makes sense for us to do that, but what? I didn't take into account is what happens 
to somebody else if Hapoalim becomes insolvent. Right? If that happens, that's going to adversely affect the other bank. It's going to adversely affect the last people in line to get their money out if there's a run on that, on that uh, 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 bank. So that's one. That's the that's the example that I I went through uh, 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 just before. There's also macroeconomic uh, effects. If there is a run, for whatever reason, banks are going to try to raise uh, cash, selling assets. They're going to shut loans off. They want to keep all their liquidity to pay the depositors who are lining up. Uh, to, to withdraw their deposits, and that has adverse effects on GDP, on employment, and so on and so forth. So these are people who aren't even customers. Somebody who's unemployed may not be a customer of either of these banks, but is harmed uh, anyway. Uh, so what are the responses uh, to these two externalities? Well, there are two main uh, uh, responses. Uh, the first one chronologically is the establishment of the lender of last resort. Central banks are born. W what do they do? Bank faces a run, can go to the central bank, which basically today can print money. You got to run, here's a barrel of money, borrow it pay it out to the, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the nervous people in line. And of course, the hope is that the knowledge that the bank can do this, that the, commercial, the ordinary bank can go to the central bank and get a wheelbarrow of cash at any time, uh, should make it less likely that there's a run in the first place. Uh, the next response is deposit insurance. Okay. The government guarantees the value of deposits. This could be formal, as it is in the United States. I don't know if you have a formal deposit insurance fund in Israel. Do you? Is there, a, is there an actual deposit insurance fund? Do you even know? You probably don't know. Do you, does anybody know? You don't have, but you do not have one. Okay, but. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, every single time that it, there's been a threat of the type that we've been talking about, every shekel of depositors has been made whole. In fact, it's gone much further than that in this, and in this country. Uh, so there is informal, I informally, you have more deposit insurance than I do. Uh, so it doesn't have to be, it, it's a, what's important is that the government makes it known that the value of bank deposits is one shekel equals one shekel. That divorces, you're going to be paid off no matter what the bank does. There's a divorce between the welfare of the depositors and the bank's balance sheet. Bank has no assets, that's no problem for you. If it's no problem for you, there's not going to be a bank run. Why should you care whether there's assets or not assets? Okay. Did, did any of you know what the capital ratio of Bank Hapoalim is? Raise your hand if you knew even roughly what it, what it was. If you're a finance person, maybe you did. How many of you were depositors in the Bank of you said, you know, why, why should you care? You're rationally ignorant about the health of Bank Hapo because it doesn't matter to you. Uh, 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 in the U.S. history, which I know more about than I know th this country, both of these responses were, in fact, responses to financial crises. The central bank was set up in 1913 six years after a uh, crisis in 1907. That's interesting. Exactly 100 years before the last one kind of began. And deposit insurance was created in the 1933 crisis when there was a massive bank run 
on the whole system and uh, uh, all the banks were shut down. And then in the intervening period, deposit insurance was created on an emergency basis. The bank runs ended and uh, it was made permanent the next year or two. Uh, but here is the, here is the message, <laughs> the offsetting behavior. The, these responses create their own externality. It's called moral hazard. Uh, this is a term in the insurance business, which means that insurance generally tends to increase risks. If you have a fire insurance policy on your house, you're less worried about taking precautions to prevent your house from, uh, from uh, burning down. And that creates problems for your neighbor. Uh, uh, and we'll see the application here in, in banking. The depositors, to the extent that they're insured, don't care about bank risk taking, uh, about bank leverage, how much uh, capital it has relative to its assets. And the bank doesn't have to be afraid of illiquidity. In a pinch, it can go to the central bank and borrow uh, 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 to, to meet any extraordinary demand. Well, that's going to lead, just like precautions against fire, it's going to lead to more risk taking by the banks with losses borne by who? You know, the government, that you and me. Okay, so that's, that's the externality of moral hazard. The cost is passed on to parties who are, to people who have nothing to do with the bank, or, uh, uh, either as owners or customers or other kind of creditors. Uh, uh, th this is where contemporary bank financial regulation uh, comes in. It's to counter this risk that governments regulate now, today, bank balance sheets and other aspects of, uh, of uh, competition. And let me, let me just be clear about where I am coming from in this. I'm often thought of as hostile to regulation. But understand where this regulation is coming from. And uh, you, it's, it's hard for somebody like me to say, well, we just should deregulate everything. That's not what I'm here to tell you. If the government is doing lender of last resort, if it's doing deposit insurance, it's already intervening. And given that, obviously the government is going to have a say in what the banks can do, has to, because that affects the cost that's borne by everybody else from the risk taking, including the government's own budget for, for all, if that was the only thing that uh, uh, mattered. Uh, let me indicate, for example, how, just, just as a, to, 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 to show you what's at stake here, how deposit insurance and bank risk interact. Now here's a simple example. We have this bank, it's got, $9 of deposits, $1 from the, uh, the, the owners of the bank, it's got 10 in, in uh, assets. Okay, so the bank can do one of two things. It can be very safe. It keeps all those assets in cash or treasury bills or something very safe. Or, and, and in which case, the owner's equity is going to be won no matter what happens. Or it can gamble. Okay, so, so imagine uh, that it takes these $10 of assets. I, I'll give you an extreme example. There's, a, there's a, a bowl in front of me and I have a number one, two, and three. If I take out number two or number three, the $10 of assets become worthless. Think of that like a very risky project where the two out of three chance that it's going to be worthless. If I take out number one, it doubles from 10 to 20. That's a, it's not a bet I would take. You know, two chances to lose 10 just for one chance of making 10, that's crazy. 
in, 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 from, from a social kind of perspective, it's excessive. So on average, bets like this are going to produce uh, losses. It's like building buildings, one of which is going to be successful, and the other two will never be occupied by anybody because they're in the wrong place. It's crazy. Uh, but it's not so crazy for this bank. Uh, uh, if, if faced with playing it safe or playing this risk, those are the only two choices, it's going to take the risk. Okay, now here, that's, here's a calculation, but forget that. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen if I pull out two or three? I'll lose the bank, the owners, one. One. What happens if I pick out one, the number one? I get 10. I get all of the gain from 10 to 20. Now, you know, if I had a casino telling me, pick two, pick three, you'll lose one. Pick one, you'll get 10. Obviously, I'll take that. I don't have to do this calculation to know that that's a good, uh, that's a good bet. Uh, it's, it's has a, it has a positive expected value. Now, why am I able to do this? Because the, the, the depositors don't know I took the risk. They don't care that I took the risk. And they, in fact, rationally don't care I took the risk. They're going to be made whole. That's what makes this example work. So if I were running a bank, and I was, uh, 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 I wasn't greedy, I wasn't grass, I just wanted to do the best thing for my stockholders, I would take this risk. And what would you think about, what, what, would a, what would a rationally organized bank in a world like this do? If it was big and it had to hire people and it had to compensate them, it would hire it would hire the, uh, uh, the kind of executive who took big risks, and it would say, uh, here's a big reward. You give them big bonuses if they, uh, if they succeed in taking the risk to tilt their incentives to do the bet instead of the safe path. So, so uh, it's, it's, it's no accident that you see uh, 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 big bonuses and, and uh, highly compensated executives with most of the compensation coming from, uh, from uh, uh, bonuses in a business uh, like this. You shouldn't be uh, uh, surprised. Uh, 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 there's going to be even more risk. All right. Why should I invest a dollar? Right. Why not make it 50 cents? Then, uh, the, if I pick a two or three, I lose 50 cents instead of a dollar. Isn't that better? I still get the doubling if, if I pick a one. Uh, the insured depositors don't care. So the bank owner would like to reduce the capital that they expose to risk, you know, to zero if they could. But less capital means more risk for the government, for you and me. All right. So uh, regulation is supposed to overcome the incentive to riskier assets and greater leverage. But uh, 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 how successful it is remains to be seen. So. So if you're, if you're not going to want to have the bank take these risks, you've got to sit on it. If you're not going to want the bank to run its capital down to zero, you're going to have to force it somehow to maintain the capital uh, that you uh, desire. How is, yes, excuse me. Uh, is the guarantee that you get, I think it's two hundred fifty thousand dollars on a deposit. Is is that something that the bank can choose whether or not to get, or that's across the board? Every citizen. Oh, you're, you're asking about the American. Not the American. Okay, if so you the insure a, 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 a house for fire, 
But the insurance company won't give you right. unless you protect your house and have a Okay, so 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 when, when a bank when a black bank applies for a charter, which you can do in the US happens, we have 8,000 uh, banks. Uh, at that point, the deposit insurer can say I don't like your plan uh, and turn you down. Once you are insured, they can't uninsure you unless they shut you down. Okay, so so th that's not uh, th that's not no longer voluntary. Uh, uh, every depositor gets two hundred fifty thousand insurance on paper. In practice, and this is important actually for what's going on. In practice, it depends. Let's say you have a million. You want to put. The bank. Now, now, a million is too small because you can spread it easily around to four banks and each one will have to insure you 250. Well, the point I'm getting at is uh, you, are, you are covered for more than that if you have deposited in the right bank. Eh? What's the right bank? Bank of America, Citicorp, Chase Manhattan. You are de facto, just like in Israel, 100% insured. If you deposited in my neighborhood bank, you're exposed. In other words, where a private insurance company will take away the insurance if your house is they, flammable, yeah. the government can't take away They can, in principle. They don't accept under certain circumstances, which I'm getting to now. What, what, what is it that they actually do? You want to know the truth? the real truth, they can do whatever they want. This is, uh, this is the, uh, the lawyers will tell you differently, but it's not true. So who, who are they? Usually it's the central bank. It, it's, it, that's the case in, in Israel. Sometimes it's the central bank and the specialized agency, as it is we've just talking about the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Uh, 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 in, in the European Union, it's now up in the air, and completely up in the air, up to now, and, and including now, it's the national central banks, which have only one function left, which is to regulate bank balance sheets and practices and so on and so forth. It, it, they're f trying to find a way to end that. What, what is it that they regulate? Well, capital ratios the composition of assets, risky ones, not so risky ones. Uh, w w when you go to the central bank and say, I want to borrow a, a, a barrel of shekels to meet a sudden upsurge in convertibility claims, uh, you, you have to post collateral. Well, what, what is going to be the collateral that you're going to have to post? H how should the assets be valued? Okay, so I should add actually now to this list securities commissions like the Securities and Exchange Commission, which are very involved now in this, this aspect of regulation for non-banks, for big financial institutions that are publicly traded but are not banks. Yes? Uh, okay, I, I, understand, I understand from you that uh, in this uh, macroeconomic uh, environment, there's a huge incentive to open uh, new banks. So what is the issue? Why everyone who have enough money or have the possibility to gather capital doesn't do it? Why, yes, why, why don't we have a lot of pe people? But what we do. And that's why uh, 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 <laughs> next entry, exit, and merger are regulated. You can't just, oh, you have to go, in the U.S. case, you have to go to the Federal Deposit Insurance Commission and you say, uh, here's my plan, here's how much capital I'm going to put in, and here's, here's what I'm going to do with uh, the money, and they say yes or no, and they've been more or less restrictive in, uh, uh, in the past. In, in Israel, you have a uh, regulatory system inherited from the British, which makes it very restrictive. In fact, I, I like keep telling people, I'm old enough to remember the founding of the State of Israel. I have a very clear memory of the founding of the, all the banks you see here, 
They're the same ones that were there in 1948, if not before. The banks of any, any size and any presence. Okay, so the, you, you, would like to get a, you would like to get at least a shot. You know, I, I could leave it as an exercise for those of you who are econ majors to figure out what would happen in equilibrium if you had a very generous chartering uh, uh, policy but these guarantees. And I'm not going to answer the question because I don't have I'll leave it as an exercise. So for us, like uh, investors, so it's uh, just a win situation because we can uh, invest Except you're in too late. And you're all, too the late. all the time the banks I, I, I have two, going up. Two things, two things to tell you. You're too late. The stock market has capitalized all of that in the current price of the bank. All of its advantages, number one. Number two, you know, the truth is Israeli banks are not that profitable. They, they manage to dissipate. They're protected from a lot of competition. They manage to dissipate it all in ways that I, I, don't, I can't begin to, uh, to uh, uh, understand. Branches on every corner, high salaries for the workers, and so on, and, uh, and uh, 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 so forth. But... but uh, there is, uh, let me wait, I'll, I'll come back to this in another, uh, another uh, uh, slide. Now, how do they regulate, you know? How do they set these capital ratios? How do they decide when it's too low, too high? The, that, the, the real answer is they do what they want. The notion that we have, we being every developed country has a rule of law stops here. This is a rule of absolute, I mean, that's the only way to, to describe it. Uh, 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 I, 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 I'll, I'll, one example, which I'm coming to. The US, in response to a financial crisis, which I'll get to it, pa the Congress passed a law that said, these regulators, were, it was motivated by the fact that these regulators were seen to be too cozy with the industry and uh, weren't shutting banks down when they should have. And that made the problem worse in the sense that the depositors didn't care, but the losses got bigger over time, and the, uh, the government eventually had to kick money into the deposit insurance fund. And the, the Congress said, you know, when the capital ratio gets down to 3%, no more. You've got you to begin to shut down the bank. Just shut it down, because it's gonna go to, if it goes down to 3, it's going to go down to 0. Uh, uh, you have to shut it down. Comes 2007, that law is on the books. The truth is that Bank of America, Citicorp, Citibank, one or two others, by any generous calculation, were under 3%. What happened, in fact, they weren't shut down. They were too big to fail. They were bailed out. How were they bailed out? The Federal Reserve, basically, you know, let's cut through all the mumbo jumbo, the Federal Reserve cranked out enough cash to infuse, to buy loans that were worth 50 cents for 100 cents and uh, make, made them, to, to say that, uh, it says how should assets be valued, Sto to say that stuff that was worth 50 cents really is worth 100 cents, there's, there's no important legal limitation on what these folks can do with my money. Now we mentioned interest groups, so I should uh, have to say something about uh, interest groups. Uh, the outcome of the regulation affects uh, every participant, the banks, the borrowers, and the people who borrow money from the banks. Okay, and uh, 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 this creates incentives for these groups to organize for what? To secure advantageous rules. So there's no limit on, on 
what these regulators can, can do. It says advantageous rules. Advantageous actions on the part of the regulators would be a better a way of uh, phrasing this. And who are the main interest groups? I said the banks, big borrowers, including importantly the government, which is the biggest borrower of all, and uh, 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 people who lend money to banks. That would be depositors and other kind of uh, creditors. All right. Uh, what do they want? Well, the banks, it's clear, you already saw what they want. Low capital, high risk, and broad insurance coverage. That's what they want. OK, well, let me add something else that's not here. They also want protection from competition. We heard your Mr. Friedberg and his trials and tribulations trying to start a new bank in the state of Israel. Uh, I can assure you that uh, one argument in, inside the Bank of uh, Israel was, you know what, that's going to make the profitability of the existing banks less. And we have, we, it's going to reduce our leverage against them. They're going to come and say, well, now that, we're now, that now that you let that bank in and our profits are a little bit less, you're going to have to let us take more risks. And that's not what you want us to do, right? Well, don't charter new banks. So there's a, there's a clear interest in, in uh, uh, limiting uh, competition as well that uh, I should have added to this list. Uh, who are the borrowers? Well, it depends. Organi the organized borrowers in the American context would be industries like real estate and housing, which are uh, uh, well treated by the government and other dimensions. They have powerful lobbies to get favors from other parts of the government. They're sitting watching what the regulators do to them. What do they want? They want favorable regulatory treatment for their loans. Right? Whatever you do, don't call my loan unsafe. Don't do that. My loan is very safe. And, and uh, uh, the bank is taking no risk with us. Uh, what does the government want? Well, it's the biggest borrower. So it wants to, uh, uh, it doesn't want to do anything to, uh, 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 to, to reduce its access to the banks when it wants, to, wants them to buy government bonds. Those securities that somebody asked about are often government debt. And it also wants to direct credit to politically important sectors. In the history of this country, that's been a particularly important uh, uh, aspect of the interplay between these uh, groups. Who, the depositors, to the extent that they are organized, what do they want? They want to be insured. They, they want to be covered. Uh, and so how does the intervention work in practice? Okay, now I'm going to uh, try to be even-handed here. And the, the answer is it, it, it is a mixed picture. Uh, uh, let's take the, free, the it started to, to mitigate or reduce or eliminate, to, to, to act to reduce bank runs. Well, it succeeded more or less in that, but the more or less is also important. Uh, 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 the, the exceptions are you have significant deposits that are officially uninsured in a system like ours where we have official deposit insurance. And uh, uh, if those deposits are at banks like Citi or Bank of America uh, uh, and you have a doubt about being able to access them, that could trigger a bank run. And in fact, there was a bank run in the United States, not of the traditional kind, but I'm not going to get into the details. There was a kind of deposit that was very, that had grown up for very good reasons in this kind of a system that uh, was uninsured and uh, the government was slow in making it clear that it was really insured. And there was effectively a bank run by institutions. 
And uh, 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 another case was Cyprus a couple of years ago now. Uh, the uh, Cyprus banks had a solvency crisis, uh, a uh, solvency crisis that led to a run. They went to the European Central Bank. They're part of the Eurozone. Uh, this is the Greek part of Cyprus. And uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, 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 went, they, they sought a bailout. And somehow, I don't know how this happened, the relevant decision maker there said, the insured depositors are going to take a hit. We're going to bail you out. But the insured depositors have to take a hit. The whole European Union came within 24 hours of having a massive bank run. Because the message was, you're not 100% insured. And remember the basic principle. If, if, you're, the, if, if you're afraid of, for the value of your deposits, you want to be in line first. Well, over the weekend, somebody got to them and they, they backed off. Uh, so, but, but the classical bank run of the ordinary depositors worrying about getting their money, that's pretty much gone. Lender of last resort, it's mixed. It failed in the 1930s. Uh, uh, for, um, I'm not going to go into that old history. It succeeded in 2008 forward in the sense that once the central bank started throwing liquidity into the system, the bank run that's on line two the, uh, 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 ended, and uh, uh, the system got through the crisis. We're still dealing with the consequences, but uh, 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 it's, uh, on, the, on the whole, you would say it's, it, uh, it uh, succeeded. Uh, uh, what about the regulation that's supposed to now reduce the risk taking that's going to occur because of the moral hazard? Well, that's mixed. E each interest group has gotten something out of this. And I'm going to illustrate that starting with the banks themselves. Uh, uh, let, let's just take one example here, which is the, uh, what's happened since deposit insurance was created. Well, you can see this is the 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 capital ratio of U.S. commercial banks. You can see it starts out at 18 percent. Here comes deposit insurance. Within a decade, it's down to 8 or even less. And then you see it bounces around. Nothing much happens for about 40 years or even more. And then you see a, a box that says FDICIA and a big, there's a, there's a little noticeable upward blip. But uh, I'll come to what that means. But uh, 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 you couldn't have a clearer picture of the moral hazard in this dimension. The banks succeeded in getting what they want as a result of the incentives facing them. Uh, much lower capital ratios, the, the inverse of that is much higher, lever what you call that, more leveraged uh, banks. So you see U.S. banks, Bank Hapoa Lim, they're pretty much in the same uh, ballpark uh, uh, today. Uh, 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 so, as I said, nothing much happens for a while. We have World War II. We have the government stuffing the banks with relatively safe government bonds. The system uh, uh, kind of goes along until the late 1980s. There's the first of three banking crises that we've had over the last 25 years or so. Uh, what's the savings and loan crisis? I'm not going to go into the, d the details of how it came about. Savings and loans are specialized banks. I don't know that you have anything quite analogous to them here. Uh, they're, uh, uh, they're forced to lend only to the, they were, they're, they're, they don't exist anymore in this form. They were, they're forced to, to lend to the real estate industry. Uh, many of them became insolvent. Uh, 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 there were runs. There were, the end result was losses borne by the government in excess of $100 billion. 
uh, dollars. Uh, 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 the response to that was this box that you see, it says FDICIA, that's the law that said we're going to toughen capital standards. We're going to require banks, the Congress telling the Federal Deposit Insurance Commission that they had to toughen their standards and shut banks down when they hit a minimum of, of, uh, of uh, 3%. Uh, uh, and they also, they basically, the specialization in uh, real estate uh, 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 was, was eliminated. Uh, but uh, that didn't end the financial crisis. You saw that blip up. Fin capital ratios did go up. Uh, uh, not much, but noticeably. But so did the riskiness of assets, right? So they forgot about that. It's not just the capital ratio, it's what you do with the, cap with the capital and the deposits that matters. Banks have very powerful incentives to have a lot of risk, and they did. They started lending outside of the United States in, in bucketfuls, and there was a crisis in the late 1990s when uh, they uh, uh, loans to less developed countries riskier creditors started to default. Uh, the largest U.S. banks in this case absorbed enormous losses uh, and there was a response. What was the response? More regulation. Sit harder on these people. Uh, 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 let's regulate more than we have in the past the risk of the assets. So you may, have, you may have heard things about the Basel Agreement. It actually goes back well before 1998, but it got much more tough. These losses were not only uh, specific to the United States, but lots of banks all over the world got hit. And uh, the central bankers met in Basel, Switzerland, which is there. They have a central bank for central banks. And they meet there occasionally, and they said, well, what we have to do now is to emphasize the risk of assets. So each asset gets a risk weight now. Right? If, if, if it's cash, it's zero. If it's, uh, 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 if it's a, a bet at a casino, it might be uh, uh, three or five or something like that. Uh, and uh, the target becomes capital not just divided by assets, which was in that uh, fiduciary law, FDICIA, uh, 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 but it's capital divided by the risk-weighted sum of assets. Now, what, is this, what's the, what does this mean? Well, it means a new arena for interest group competition. Now, here's the bank. It wants to have as much leverage as it can get away with. Uh, you, it wants to go to the, to the regulator and say, you know this asset that you want to give us a risk weight of two, it should be zero. So the, 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 an example, which is not really an example, it's the truth. You go to the Federal Reserve and you, or the F, FDIC and you say, look, I know I'm making these risky mortgages, very risky mortgages, and uh, you know, uh, y you're gonna be, uh, if it, you're gonna give them a big risk weight. But you know what? The law of large numbers. Uh, if I hold a share of a thousand of them, it's like insuring a thousand houses. It's not really very risky. That's safe, and you know what? Uh, Federal Reserve said, it said, yeah, you're right. So it gave them a very low risk weight. The other, sometimes called shadow banking, is you take these risky assets and you move them off of the balance sheet that the Federal Reserve can see. I'm not going to go into where and how, but they're really still a, 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 a liability of, uh, uh, of the bank. What about the borrowers, including the government borrowers? 
Well, you want a loan to me to be safe so that the bank will be more willing to loan it to, to me or will charge me a lower interest rate because it has a lower risk weight. The example here is Greek government debt for a Eurozone bank has a risk weight of zero. As any, any sovereign government in the Eurozone has, uh, has a debt, the, it's, it's given a risk weight of zero. Okay. So what's the result of this common interest? Both the borrowers and the bank want things to be called safe. It says, how does 5% become 17? Or is it 3.5? What am I talking about? Here you see, does anybody, oh, you can see the name here. Lower, this is the biggest bank in the Eurozone. All right? In red, we have how much capital they have. It's already, f it's core tier one capital. What, what, is, what does that mean? I don't know means total assets, comma, adjusted. Are they adjusted up? No, no, they're adjusted. What are the, how are they adjusted? I don't know. Divide four quickly, 41.7 by 11.7. That's three and a half percent. You know that. That's within a half percent of the Fiducia Act's rule to shut them down. Uh, just below, uh, uh, that's, that's as close as I can get from this handout to the truth about what capital ratio is. Right below that, you see it says leverage ratio also adjusted, footnote 2, 19. Well, that's the inverse of the supposed capital ratio. That works out to 5.3. So the red one is about three and a half. This one is 5.3. You go up to the top, core tier one capital ratio, tier one capital ratio, 17. That's the risk weight. That's, that's the, excuse me, the fiction that Greek government debt is absolutely safe. So you can take it out of the denominator completely. So here you have a system of risk weighting, which leads to what? The one thing you're for sure that it leads to is non-transparency. All right? This is just for starters. I don't know what the capital ratio is of Deutsche Bank, except that the thing in red is probably clo close to the, the truth. If it doesn't already exaggerate the truth, than the 17 or the 13. Did somebody have it? Okay. So, so uh, 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 let me summarize. Oh boy, we're running a little bit late here. Uh, uh, it's, it, it clearly has reduced uh, the externalities from illiqu illiquidity and insolvency. Uh, we don't have contractions in the money supply like we had in the 1930s. We don't have bank runs of the classic kind anymore. But it's created a moral hazard externality. And that requires further intervention, which is the regulation of risk taking. But those, as you can see, the results of that have been mixed at best. Uh, you want me to go back? You have a question? Yes. You're saying that without regulation, uh, customer was very incentive and the world banks that have either a high ratio of uh, equity or higher uh, yes. interest. On the other hand, you're saying that all customers are rationally able. So That's with regulation. So the, the, the regulated world and the unregulated world on this dimension are c affected greatly by the effect by, by the regulation. No, if you were, if you were on, if, uh, look, suppose you have a, a, uh, 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 a, a big stake. You might be rationally ignorant if your stake is so small that losing it all doesn't matter to you. But if you have, like, your bank deposit account 
is a big part of your total wealth, and you put it into the stock market. You're following the stock market a little bit more closely than you're following Bank Hapoa Lim's balance sheet, I can assure you. And why is that? Because the stock value is not insured, and you want to be a little bit more careful about what's the risk of the company I'm investing in, and should I be investing in this kind of a risk or that kind of a risk. That's because you're not insured. Uh, 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 but if you were, if somebody said, well, the stock market's insured, well, you, why would you worry? So, so the moral hazard is a result of the government intervention. And it leads to this, regula this other regulatory response, this other kind of uh, intervention, which has mixed uh, results. All right, so uh, we're getting near the end here. Uh, what are the mixed results? Well, financial crises clearly haven't ended. They're recurrent, at least in my country, three times now in the period since roughly uh, 1990. Balance sheets have clearly become riskier. Uh, there's higher leverage than before regulation. And you see that by world, world standards, Bank Hapoa Lim compares very favorably to Deutsche Bank. You know, the, I, I don't, go and, don't go and shout this in the street, but the real reason Deutsche Bank even exists today after what it, it, what's happened in the Eurozone is that there's a German government. Let's face it, that's really the the ultimate reason why you don't worry too much about the continu continuation of that, uh, of that uh, bank. Uh, it, whatever risk it has is clearly is unclear at this uh, point. Uh, uh, there's the risk weighting issue, there's the shadow banking issue. You don't know what the risk of the system is. That makes the crises worse when they happen because when the things go bad, uh, they go bad uh, uh, together. That's the fallacy in the one subprime loan is risky, but a thousand are safe. And everything becomes more subject to political uh, influence. The reason we had a subprime crisis is we had a public policy to have affordable housing, and we had a system where the government could tell banks either you should invest in affordable housing or we will create trouble for you, or the opposite, if you invest in affordable housing, we'll give it a risk weight that makes it attractive to you. Uh, uh, so the, I, I end with the question here, uh, uh, close to the end anyway, what's going to happen to Deutsche Bank if that zero risk Greek debt actually defaults. It actually has defaulted, but, but it defaulted in a way where if you, were, if you were Deutsche Bank, you pretended that it didn't default, and if you were somebody else, you had to bear the loss. Uh, uh, well, let me say briefly, I haven't said anything about Israel, so let me say briefly where Israel fits into this story. Uh, 2008, very little direct effect from the crisis. Uh, 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 it, it has a regulated uh, ba a banking uh, system that is similar in many ways to some systems that did go uh, into uh, stress. The UK being the uh, the most prominent example, but also Ireland and uh, Holland and Belgium and uh, uh, Spain has a similar uh, system. It, it's a system of few banks entry very tightly uh, uh, controlled. But other systems like Canada and Australia, also the British system, also came through it uh, very well. The general pattern here, if there is any, is if you, don't, if, you, if you didn't have exposure to subprime mortgages or you had a local, or you didn't have a local housing price boom, you, you, you were able to avoid uh, 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 trouble. Now, I've, I'm, I'm hearing that you, ha you do have a housing price boom now. It means you should be a little bit careful. 
but, and, and you should be a little bit careful because you should also be aware of the history of Israeli banking. It's not exempt from any of these incentives or the results. Uh, Israel had two major banking crises in the 1980s. Uh, 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 we can talk about these in more uh, uh, detail. Uh, they came very quickly one after the other. Uh, uh, both in a real way threatened the solvency of the banking system. Uh, 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 both led to uh, uh, initial, initial losses to the stockholders. Uh, both led to government absorption of all the significant losses, including the stockholders. So they went further than just insuring every shekel of deposits. They even insured the stockholders. Now, there, there were reasons for it. And you know, I don't want to get into personal history, but I stand before you as a beneficiary of the Israeli bailout of uh, stockholders. I'm not going to say any more about uh, that. I'm going to say a little bit more and close with wh where are we now? Uh, I don't want to say very much. The response to the recent crisis has been yet another round of increased uh, regulation in all uh, dimensions. Uh, we now have officially systemically important banks. We now have the European Union that says question mark groping toward common regulatory policy uh, 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 to take to take the reg to centralize the regulation uh, in the European Central Bank or some other agency that will coordinate with the European Central Bank, we now have another round of Basel risk weighting. They kind of given up on figuring out the appropriate risk weights. Now they want the capital ratios to increase. Uh, gradually, but uh, they're fighting against an industry which doesn't want that and makes its views not only known, but uh, 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 affects the actual policy. Did you, did some, yes, Ab? If, if, well, you know, you could have, uh, you could have, uh, uh, th th that's true. The higher the actual capital ratio is, the bigger the losses that depositors can, uh, that, uh, the, uh, that, can, that can occur before depositors are going to be harmed. And unlike Israel, unlike Israel, uh, most bailouts, have imposed substantial losses on the stockholders. The central banks are willing, with this exception, to do that. So yes, yes, if they do it, if it happens, and it may happen, but you see what the game is, uh, the moral hazard incentives have increased. You have now an increased incentive to find non-transparent ways to invest in risky assets. And you also have this creation of a new regulatory agency just for banks that are supposed to be systemically important. What does that mean? I'm, I'm telling you, this bank is not systemically. This one is. It means we're not going to let it fail. So now you've made it official that some banks are too big to fail. And that increases the moral uh, hazard. Uh, the role of interest groups has increased. The stakes are greater now. Uh, we've, had, we've had a five-year debate in the U.S. on something called the Volcker, Volcker Rule. What is that? Banks are not supposed to be able to trade for their own account, which means they're not supposed to go to the casino and buy and sell stuff that is very risky. That was the intent. Uh, Except, well, you know, look, look at that balance sheet. It has securities. They got to buy those securities. Maybe there's a, there should be a provision where they don't have to hold them until they mature. Maybe they should be able to sell them and replace. What does it really mean? Well, it's 
five years since they started working on this. They issued a final rule and already the banking lobby is in the office saying that final rule is really stupid, folks, because it doesn't account for this, this, and this. And they're right. And they're right. You know, I, I, I was a, a student of Milton Friedman's. I was also a student of Friedrich Hayek. No em enforcer of the Volcker rule is ever going to be f able to figure out what trading for your own account is and what the ordinary day-to-day -day operations of the bank are. They're faced by another side which has the information uh, and the incentives to avoid uh, 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 this. It's a, it's a game that ultimately they will uh, lose. And for that reason, the question is not really, are we going to have another crisis? I think, but when? How long is it going to take for this round of regulation to be offset by new ways of getting our effort? Right now, we're in the phase of uh, it's reducing, it's, it's causing them to fight against a regulatory push for uh, less risk. How long is that going to last? I don't know, but it is going to end if history is any guide, and then we'll have another one. So I'm sorry to end with that kind of pessimistic uh, <laughs> uh, 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 conclusion, semi-conclusion, but uh, I, am a, I, I like to be realistic about these things, and uh, uh, I, I also respect history. So thank you very much. I'm sorry. Uh, would you do you think it was a mistake to repeal uh, Glass-Steagall that allowed... Okay, so what's Glass... Glass the Glass-Steagall Act is a, a law passed in the 1930s which was like this, kind of like the Volcker Rule. It tried to divorce the banks from engaging in non-banking activities that were thought to be risky, like Wall Street like other things like that. So, so uh, during the 1990s, uh, 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 the banks decided they wanted to go into things like insurance and investment bank. They were already in it, actually. They wanted to go more in it. And that, that law was repealed. Okay? Now, this time, this time, very little of what happened in the crisis had much to do with the new powers they got under the repeal of Glass-Steagall. Nevertheless, I have to tell you this, I was a supporter of repealing the Glass-Steagall Act because I read the history the way I'm describing it to you now. I am now more doubtful, but it has nothing to do with the way Glass-Steagall worked or the way the repeal worked. It has to do more with the capacity of the regulators to prevent the incentives from uh, uh, the moral hazard incentives from working their way uh, out, uh, uh, and their and their Hayekian incapacity to understand what the banks are really doing. All right. For that reason, I would go slow on granting banks new powers. Although, you know, having said that, what is going to happen if you restrict? You'd say banks can't go into the insurance business. But what? Can they loan money to an insurance company? Can they loan money on terms that are tied to the profitability of the insurance company? Yes and yes. So uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's more because uh, 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 the, the regulators are going to have less discretion if banks are made simpler that I say that than anything else. Okay? Uh, so, but the, the, uh, uh, the short answer is there's very little connection between in this case, in this case, between Glass-Steagall, its repeal, and what, what uh, uh, went on, everything that happened, the investing in subprime mortgages, 
what could have happened, whether you had Glass-Steagall repealed or not. The, uh, the, the pushing the risk off the balance sheet could have happened whether you had Glass-Steagall or not. In fact, if you repeal Glass-Steagall, you'll have more of that. I mean, that's, that's in inevitable. A any other question or I guess then? You? Okay, so you can. Thank you. Thank you.